for anybody who made the great migration from the university center, you know, I appreciate it. I almost melted. Um, so thank you all for being here with me. I'm going to try to make this a pretty informative and pretty interesting talk. Um, I think this is some a talk that has not been covered in a lot of places and, you know, it may not necessarily be 100% cyber, but I think it will ha uh, have you leave with something that makes you just say, wow, I, I learned something new. So that's the goal. Um, the way this talk started about how I decided, hey, I want to talk about uh, KYC, AML, and we'll talk about what that is, and Cyber Threat Intel is uh, actually because of my wife. Um, we actually just got married uh, three months ago. Uh, we're together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had to shout that out. She's not here, so she'll kill me if she did. <laughs> But um, she's actually an anti-money laundering analyst. Um, so she works for a consulting firm in which she works with financial clients. And she reviews suspicious transaction alerts all day. That's pretty much what she does. So if a user at a bank does something suspicious, it gets flagged. And she will review that alert. And me, I'm, I'm, we both work remote, so I'm very all over the place. Um, I will kind of uh, stumble into her office 20 times a day, and you know I'm I'm kind of like that annoying brother where I'm just like, what you do, right? Yeah. So um, after like the 50 million time in the morning, she goes, I'm reviewing this transaction because I think it's this, this, and this. And um, a little bit about me actually is I uh, worked in incident response in digital forensics. So when she talked to me about her triage process on how she investigated financial alerts, I said, that's what I do. Well, that's what I did. Um, I can do your job. Um, and she, <laughs> do not say that. Do not say that to your job. Because then I'll say the most stupid stuff. I'll go up to her and I'll just take a financial term and I'll be like, structuring. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll be like, get out of your job. So uh, anyway, I, I, I started to really like the similarities, and I started to look at reporting, uh, specifically financial reporting. And I realized with a lot of that financial crime reporting, it intersects with a lot of cyber reporting. So you see like DOJ, Department of Justice indictment, um, Department of Justice reports, and there's a lot of similarity in which in, in those reports, they talk about cyber, the stuff we love. They say this hacker, uh, had this botnet and they did this. And as CTI professionals, as DFIR professionals, cyber professionals, we love that, right? We want to see that execution chain, seeing phishing to this, to this, right? But we don't really care about what they're doing it for, right? So if they say they're using it uh, to collect cryptocurrency uh, and then mix it to distribute for money laundering, we're like, eh, you know, I watch Breaking Bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't think that's right. So that's a little bit about what this talk is about. Sorry, I'm just making sure the stopwatch is on. So as we all know, cybercrime is on the rise. I could give you 10 million statistics, but the truth is between the exploitation of zero days, between attacking uh, more verticals such as healthcare, uh, public government sectors, uh, it's just on the rise. And with the rise of cryptocurrencies, the rise of uh, cryptocurrency um, ledgers and companies that aren't doing the proper controls, that really aids that process. So um, there is an organization uh, called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, in which I was reading a lot of these reports, seeing the cybercrime statistics, seeing a lot of the same terms such as phishing, such as exploitation, such as, um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, uh, basically exploitation, phishing, a lot of that cyber stuff within those financial reports. And I was just thinking to myself, and actually I was thinking to myself, funny enough, as I was watching my wife do her training videos, you know those training videos when you walk, you do it at the very last day and your manager texts you and he's like, get it done today. It was those videos. But she was having to watch videos on phishing, on uh, commanding control servers, on, um, Botnets. She was having to learn actual pretty technical terms. So it got me thinking that, hey, I'm starting to see within the FinCEN articles, 
within bank reporting and between her job that she's learning cyber. She has to take time within her job to learn cyber because it's integrating so much. And one of the, those reasons is within uh, financial industry, especially, you have fraud fusion centers that are being created in which those are really teams that take not only fraud, they take uh, anti-money laundering, and they also take CTI professionals. And they kind of mix them all together because that um, communication loop with cybercrime is uh, having all verticals. So I saw that, I saw the reports, I saw the work my wife was doing, and I said, they're learning cyber, we need to learn fraud. We need to learn financial concepts. They're doing their part, are we doing our part? Um, I put the walls are colliding me. Uh, I also had the Starship Troopers, we're doing our part. Um, but <laughs> this one won, just because George Costanza is a style king. He just has all the fits. Okay, so a little about me. Um, I put about me just because I hate the who am I. Um, but I graduated from UTSA in 2020 in a dual major in cyber and information systems and a degree in digital forensics. I went, I did numerous internships during my collegiate career. If you are in college right now, network, 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 get those internships because it helps you. Uh, upon graduating, I went to CrowdStrike in the Falcon Complete division in which I did digital forensics and incident response. So I did full-scale remediation from remoting into the client's computer and removing all the bad stuff. I realized I love it, not exactly what I want to do, so now I do cyber threat intelligence, which I love because I get to talk to people, I get to create PowerPoints, and I get to create writing. Um, if you're like the one person in here that says, like, I actually love that, um, maybe for you, so feel free to reach out. But in my whole career, I've done AppSec, I've done DevSecOps, DFIR, CTI. So I have seen all different stages of the execution chain, which in like exploitation vulnerabilities, which really kind of helped me in this presentation understand why it's so important. Um, currently, I'm doing uh, my graduate studies at Johns Hopkins University uh, in global security studies, just because I like cyber, but I think there's other areas um, of security that we need to bolster down as a nation between um, energy security, maritime security, et cetera. Uh, as far as hobbies, um, I, I love traveling, so if anybody's on the credit card and miles train, I'm that guy. Uh, I could get you a Paris for a nickel. Um, I really like uh, Warhammer 40K. I tried Dungeons and Dragons, but I was like, it needs more guns. Um, and I really love military history, um, everything about it. So, you know, if you want to talk about why assault in general is frowned upon in history, I would always love to talk about it. Okay, so what are the objectives from this talk? Understand the importance of KYC and AML within the cyber threat ecosystem. Even though it may not always be apparent at times and sometimes seems false, it is apparent. Um, cases where KYC and AML were involved and then discuss practical steps on how you could kind of get better with knowing the day-to-day uh, -day knowledge of financial crime concepts. So what is uh, KYC, know your customer and client? Uh, it's a process used by financial institutions and other regulatory companies to verify the identity, suitability, and risk associated with a business relationship. So a business relationship doesn't mean another company always. It means a lot the customer. So if you go open up a bank account, right, and they require two forms of a check, you know, um, even a library card, right, where they want uh, forms of your address to prove you live there, right, that is KYC. Um, banks do it, a lot of industries do it. Um, one statistic I put in here is that financial institutions in North America spent $62 billion on financial crime compliance with KYC being a significant part of this expenditure. So a lot of these institutions, banks especially, but not always all being hit with fines like candy. Um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. We can continue to hit them with fines, but because you know they're large-scale banks, um, they're large-scale institutions, they kind of just shrug it off. Uh, they file and then they hire a few more AML analysts. So the risk is growing, but also hopefully the amount of deterrence we're imposing on these institutions is also growing. 
So why is KYC important in industries? So you have protection against financial crimes, uh, helps pre prevent against money laundering and fraud by making sure that you identify the identity of the customer and what the customer is trying to do in terms of that business relationship. One of the things, uh, one of the two terms that are there is customer due diligence and enhanced due diligence. So with customer due diligence, sorry, I have like a million notes that I'm just trying to make sure I get everything. By the way, don't write notes with light bread light red pen, uh, it's not always <laughs> easiest to read. But basically, uh, customer due diligence is a lot of times when you open an account, right? It's asking for those two forms of ID. It's asking for uh, those baseline verification tasks. Um, and it's trying to gauge risk in that service. It's trying to gauge you as an individual or an organization, what is your risk? Do you come from a certain geopolitical sector in which maybe money laundering, terrorism financing, um, is high? Um, are you trying to move massive amounts of money in a short amount of time or do something suspicious? Basically, you're doing it up front to gauge the risk between that relationship before you onboard them as a customer, a client, a partner, etc. Then you have enhanced due diligence, and that is specifically for those higher risk folk um, and those higher risk tra transactions, and that can require things more in depth such as detailed background checks where they can ask for more info. If you say, oh, I'm moving all this money for business opportunity, you have the right, these institutions have the right to say, okay, let's see a business plan, let's see more information. Um, so enhanced due diligence can come anytime really within the process of an account opening, transaction monitoring, and that account maintenance. So if you're opening up an account, if you're maintaining an account, um, renewing it, uh, filing for credit increase, that could all gauge a certain level and enhance due diligence at any point. Then of course you have regulatory compliance. You have um, those things that we probably had to remember for quiz once or twice. You have the Bank Secrecy Act, uh, the Patriot Act, uh, and those were things like making sure that CDD and EDD were enforced, making sure that these institutions have KYC programs and AML programs. Um, and all of these are enforced by FinCEN, which, as we said before, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So, KYC, it's not always just in banks. A lot of uh, industries use KYC. So, telecommunications, unless you are scattered spiral, we do not give a SIM card to anybody, right? Um, I, I hold one laugh, so I take that out of the window. Um, <laughs> so, uh, if you try to find, by a device, open up a business account to maybe get a deal online, you have to uh, provide some sort of KYC. Gambling, money laundering, underage gambling, uh, preventing all of those. Um, fun little story, which I wish uh, prevented me from accidentally underage, underage gambling. Uh, I think when I was like 12, uh, anybody did RuneScape? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I had an account. Uh, I mined all day, you know. I broke my back in the fields just mining. And a guy came up to me, I was in like fifth grade in the chat room and said, hey, if you mine all day at the end of like a week, you know, I'm a, uh, you give me the stuff and then I'll send you like a PayPal of like, you know, $20. And I'm like 12. I'm like, oh my God, I don't have to ask my mom for more money. I don't have to mow the lawn. Uh, so I did it for like a week straight. I ran home after school, didn't do any homework, you know, just like did all that. And then at the end of the day, Guy comes up, I transfer all my stuff to him, and then he just vanishes. And then I, I realized, you know, during that time, RuneScape actually kind of had a monetary underground system. So he would take those resources from those people and uh, illicitly sell them for money, which went against the terms and condition. So, wish I knew that, you know, but um, just a fun little side story. Uh, but real estate, uh, if anybody is trying to buy a house right now or has in the past, you know, uh, God bless your strength. But also, uh, yeah, uh, also you have to provide a lot of documentation. Anybody who has put an offer on the house has been like, yes, you know, we got it. And then it's like, all right, submit these 105 forms, you know, uh, your first child's name, you know, within the next two hours. So. They require a lot of documentation, health care to ensure proper billing, prevent insurance fraud, travel and hospitality, human trafficking is a big thing, 
um, making sure that the people, the guests who come, uh, the people who are going between multiple hotels in a short amount of time, making sure they are who they say they are, and uh, the destination is where they're going to. Um, flights are a big one, trains, you know, post 9-11 era, that has definitely um, came down. Uh, education, education fraud, making sure that, hey, uh, you all who you say you all, you know, if anybody ever took like the OSCP and stuff and you needed, you know, literally a camera and every single asset of your life for 24 hours, uh, it's to prevent a lot of that stuff. So let's talk about uh, vendor KYC, right? KYC in the cybersecurity space. So um, we're going to use Conti as an example. So uh, Conti, widely known as the successor to Ryan ransomware, uh, kind of leveraged by Wizards Fidel, or some call the TrickBot group, leveraged ransomware as a service. Um, so it would use affiliates uh, to distribute its ransomware. Delivered a wide amount of malware via phishing exploit kits and compromised websites. So uh, they were the big name of the game for quite a while. And then what happened was um, they were active since 2020, they were Russian, and uh, one of the main things about them is they did double extortion. So they would encrypt it false, and then they would say, hey, we're going to sell it online um, if you don't pay. Uh, so then they would distribute through their various uh, data link sites. But they were very popular and very rising, and then what happened was they, when the war in Ukraine broke out, they said, if anybody messes with Russia, you know, you're going to feel the full force of Conti. Um, and what happened was a uh, Ukrainian, I believe at this point in time, it's believed that a Ukrainian uh, security researcher was able to kind of infiltrate and leak uh, internal chats utilized by the Conti gang. And those are called the Conti links, uh, Conti links, because I believe that was a Twitter account. So we actually gained a lot of insight on the Conti leak chat logs, and you can actually look it up on GitHub. GitHub, um, they're translated from, I believe, like Russian and Ukrainian. So we learned that they're quite a big organization. Uh, at any point in time, they really had 60 to 100 members. Um, they had pretty much a, a wide network. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to call them an APT, but uh, they were advanced in the fact of their structure and hierarchy. They had leaders, but also they had, um, they just had a staff. So they had coders to create the exploit code and uh, you know the ransomware. They had testers to test it. They had reverse engineers, which we'll see why in a minute. They had HR individuals. So these people actually put kind of thinly veiled links on job sites because the turnover was so high because they really weren't getting paid a lot for the most of them. Um, and then of course you had affiliates. Um, affiliates with Conti uh, didn't really like working there so much just because a lot of times they got stiffed um, and so that process was a little chaotic. Um, so that's kind of the background of their internal. So they had a large budget. Um, they would dedicate a lot of money uh, at certain times to acquire security tools for their own research. And this is where KYC really comes in. So first, they wanted, uh, high, uh, what's it called? Premium licenses for Zoom Info and Crunchbase Pro, which those are kind of OSINT databases, which give you a lot of information about businesses, the hierarchy within the business, how it works, how much funding it has, um, et cetera. So if you're doing extortion of a company, uh, you really use those to really make sure that, hey, the top of the company, you have that hierarchy list and you can contact them, but also you know their internal kind of revenue. You know how much money they could give you. So they were trying to acquire to get gain them for the leverage within those negotiations. Cobalt Strike, who's called a Cobalt Strike, right? It's one of the top exploit tools um, right there with like PowerShell. Uh, can do a wider range of things. So they were trying to, I believe they paid 60K. They tried to acquire it by creating a fake company and saying, hey, will fake company give us a license? Uh, Cobalt Strike is pretty much like, uh, no, we, we don't like to give it to bad guys. Do what you know you normally do, just you know, uh, get a crack copy and take your risk with an info steal. 
Um, and apparently what they tried to do was they tried to pay a third party legitimate business to get it for them. Um, they did that also with SonicWall. They tried to obtain uh, SonicWall appliances for reverse engineering. And they tried to obtain Cisco devices as well as Colvin Black EDO and Sophos EDO, I believe the EDO for Sophos, uh, they try to obtain it legitimately um, to use it for reverse engineering to really try to see what they could do with it. Uh, one of the things they were trying to obtain from, I believe, Colvin Black and Sophos was code signing certificates so that they could you know, sign their binaries uh, and be trusted. So that's really a good measure of how you know, these vendors we may not be hearing it, we may not be seeing it, but I, I definitely know for a fact, at some level, these companies are doing KYC for their security tools. Now, are they doing it great? I don't really know. I try to find as much documentation as I could. You know, I try to DM folks, I was like, hey, how do y'all do K KYC? And they're like, I don't know you, go away, and blah. But um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that, that's an interesting thing to think of, right? We, may, we think about how, you know, they get into environments with phishing, with exploitation and stuff, but we don't really think about how, you know, we think they just code at a laptop all day. We don't really think about how they're trying to acquire infrastructure to really utilize it that'll for their games. So uh, this was a Conti chat. Um, this was about, oh, Carbon Black. Um, I, that little white is, um, it's a, uh, a cost world. I want to keep things PG here. Uh, but basically, they were trying to obtain Colin Black. Uh, and then they said they could obtain it. And they were like, who needs it? And they said, yeah, I don't really need it anymore. And they said, what about Ryuk? I guess at this time, Ryuk was still operating in some capacity. They said, I don't know if Ryuk really needs it. Um, but you know, hey, we, you know, maybe down the road, if we want to research it itself, um, we don't really know who our target is. But really, they're just going back and forth saying like, hey, I can get it, I can get the tool, what can we do with it, who wants it, right? Uh, Sonic Wall is another. These are all the Conti chats that I just kind of found uh, translated on GitHub. So this one was regarding Sonic Wall. Um, I believe the 410 appliance, which is their mobile application. Um, device which basically allows like mobile app uh, mobile devices to access like applications from anywhere I believe. So uh, they were utilizing researchers who obtained Sonic Wall devices legitimately. They paid them uh, who were able to grab it, and what they were trying to do was they were trying to obtain it for vulnerability research. Um, I believe they mentioned, yeah, they were using it for vulnerability research. And um, in photo chat, Stone is, uh, Stone was kind of the head of the Conti chats. Um, he says, who can figure out this vulnerability in Sonic Wall and make a walking scan or to see, you know, maybe on Shodan, whatever, mass scanning, who's vulnerable. Uh, this one was CVE 2020, 51-35, which was a critical Sonic Wall VPN portal uh, overflow, buffer overflow. It's not really sure um, if, they obtained uh, the way to exploit that vulnerability. Uh, there wasn't really documentation, furthermore, that attributed uh, mass exploitation, attributing it to Conti. But it definitely showed that they were looking at the capability to mass exploit uh, via resource scan. So as we see, they're trying to acquire products, trying to use it for their own nefarious gains, um, and they're really just trying to see, hey, this was an already established CVE that wasn't really being exploited. They were trying to see what the CVE does and see how they could do it more. So um, now we kind of pivot into anti-money laundering. Like uh, I, I do want to clarify, I am not a financial crime expert. Um, I am just an avid hobbyist, but basically anti-money laundering, right? We all saw Breaking Bad, you know, uh, Saul Goodman. I thought I would put on my Saul outfit, but it is too hot. Um, but it is a prevention of transactions to eventually convert illegally obtain money into legal money through various forms. Uh, the goal of anti-money laundering is to identify, prevent, and report activities related to illicit activities. These activities could be things like human trafficking, um, smuggling, um, 
drug smuggling, um, just a lot of different things. Uh, one thing that I didn't know was also anti-money laundering measures are very apparent in prisons. Um, you know, one thing out of this research I definitely realized is how big the prison e uh, crime ecosystem is and how large um, people are doing people are doing very big Venmo uh, transactions from within a four by four cell. You know, they're running multi-million dollar operations in some prisons. Uh, so it was definitely interesting to see that. But why is anti-money laundering important? So you have protection against financial crimes, right? This ensures trust between the enterprise and consumer. You go up to a bank, you give them their money, uh, your money, they tell you, hey, your FDIC insured for what, 250K usually, something like that. But you're, you have the trust that your money is going to stay there or it's going to be shifted around, you know, with the current process, but legally. So you're making sure that, hey, this bank isn't doing something bad. It's not pulling a Fred's fish fry. You're just tumbling your money around. Um, Anti-money laundering supports law enforcement in a lot of different ways. So by doing anti-money laundering investigations, you're able to support law enforcement intelligence on their current investigations. You're can, able to um, do attribution enhancement, so able to help law enforcement say, hey, this is who we think is a primary source. These are who I think the affiliates are. These I think is a supplier. This is who I think is a partner. Um, you know, I've kind of, uh, I've, I've, I've seen my wife just do amazing things from what she told me as far as she will have just a whole graph out with just a million suppliers, million affiliates just from starting out one single data point. So they really help with attribution. Um, and it helps uncover motivations in which I think is a large part of why I did this talk is because we look at a lot of crime now from a cyber lens but a lot of cyber crime is having more of a financial lens when it talks about motivation. And I think we really need to just be accustomed to seeing that more and we need to be kind of take the initiative to kind of see that more. And it enhances global security. So it disrupts the supply chains and financial operations of criminal and terrorist organizations. So it disrupts terrorism financing, human trafficking operations, um, smuggling operations by, you know, you follow the money and that's where it goes. Um, also, if anyone is interested, I, I didn't put this in my slide, but I just want to say a good book to start out with, if you are interested at all, is it's by Andy Greenberg. It's called Tracers in the Dark. Um, and yeah, pull out those phones. Um, and it's basically about a lot of things. It's about Alphabet, it's about the dark net, um, but it's, it will get, it will pique your interest as a cybersecurity individual, but also as a financial crime individual. So I, I want to say that right now before I forget. Uh, it's called Tracers in the Dark by Andy Greenberg. All right, moving on. So the AML transaction monitoring process is a huge part of anti-money laundering. Um, this is by ACAMS, which ACAMS is um, a wide certification body within anti-money laundering and financial crime. They are kind of like SAMs, except you don't have to donate an arm in the lake to pay for a SAM saw. Um, <laughs> but they are a very globally recognized body. So this is a transaction monitoring process. And this is the one that I saw my wife do. Um, and if you have done a security alert, if you have done a, you know, a digital forensics incident response um, investigation, you will see a lot of similarities. So let's go and start out with it. Let's start at step one. So you're an analyst and you see an alert uh, by your AML KYC software, right? Uh, you see it's, uh, it says, hey, there is something for structuring. Uh, there is an apparent kind of pattern uh, for structuring. Uh, does anybody know what structuring kind of is? Yes. So structuring is when you are either pulling money or um, depositing funds into your own account or other accounts. Um, and the banks use a threshold. So $10,000 is usually that threshold. It is very suspicious when an individual pulls nine grand, leaves, goes to the ATM and pulls another two grand. Um, the reason being is that the states or the federal government can ask you questions. They wanna know why do you need this amount of money? 
Most people don't like to be asked that question, so they structure funds. Yeah. She's a financial crime professional, <laughs> so uh, when she nods, I, I just go, yes, I'm doing right. Um, but essentially, yeah, in a huge part of structuring is also sometimes they do certain amounts at certain amount of times. Um, and if you are in cybersecurity, that sounds a lot like beaconing. Right. So, you know, you kind of see those similarities. So you understand the trigger event. It's saying, hey, you know, you're doing a certain amount underneath the own threshold. We see it for this reason. Try to identify if there's a pattern, something suspicious. So you, you say, OK, this is what I'm looking look at. First, as all security analysts, right, we got to understand the environment, know the customer. So if it is just a random individual, right, do they need to uh, submit $9,999 every single day for a week, right? I would say, man, that's, that's big boy money. I, I don't know why he's doing that. And if he's just making, hey, Netflix purchases on his account, you know, little things, I may say, okay, that stands out. Now, if you are a very money intensive company in which you're doing a lot of money transactions, um, you know, I'm trying to think of, what's the name? Gas stations, right? You may have a lot of big transactions going through, and that may kind of cause the suspicion level to go down. So you have to understand your customer and the environment. So if you say, okay, this is kind of suspicious, understand the activity. So you're looking at that account, and then, like any security alert, right, you're branching out to the connections. Did it make contact with any other account, um, any other uh, machine? Uh, any other Venmo uh, account, any other Cash App account. Uh, so you're trying to see what network of activity is within that alert. And you're trying to scope it in to try to create those patterns, trying to create those relationships. And you may see, hey, it's transacting to one account, but that's also transacting to another account. So you may say, oh man, this is more suspicious. Um, step four, eliminate the normal. So we may say, okay, we know Netflix accounts, we don't care about that. We know, um, you know, uh, your morning uh, avocado toast, you know, you'll never own a house, but you know, we don't care about that. Um, <laughs> it's these transactions we really want. So you will hone in on that as deep as you can. You may use various forms of OSINT, such as public databases. You know, if someone's, it's a, if it's a Venmo account and the person's husband is in prison, you may use a prison database to see like, hey, um, what is he in for? You know, what has his accounts look like? So you can kind of go off of those pivot points. Um, after that, you understand uh, the remaining activity. So you can say, okay, there's like three relationships where this money is moving towards. None of them seem to justify that amount moving so rapidly in so many an amount of times. This is suspicious. So you may report and consider divesting. That is a suspicious activity report. And I got breeze through. I made too many bad jokes. But uh, <laughs> so a suspicious activity report. That is a report filed by these people, these analysts, to notify authorities and banks of suspicious financial crimes. So it provides kind of an only warning, and it facilitates that immediate collaboration between FIs and law enforcement. So um, within this suspicious activity report. You may say, here's a case number, here's a customer, this is what they're suspected of doing. Um, it's kind of out of the ordinary because of reasons A, B, and C. This is who it's sending the money to, and this is why it's suspicious. Um, it's currently ongoing, and we recommend you know, filing law enforcement actions, etc. So you kind of have, if anybody's ever done an incident jury ticket or something, it's a lot of that, the who, what, why, when, getting that context and putting any amount of IOCs. And we're actually going to talk about that. So uh, FinCEN actually released a new SOL type, a narrative uh, for cyber events uh, starting in 2016. Um, as far as how it has been um, considered by institutions, it's kind of mixed reviews. But basically with this, AML teams and KYC teams are going to need to collaborate a lot more with uh, cyber teams because if you have a cyber event at your bank in which you think, I think it's more than $5,000 of potential impact. So even if they didn't uh, get in and steal the money, even if it's potentially $5,000, which you got gauge, uh, you have to create a soulful cyber event. In that, you put things like IP addresses, um, 
the time of day, uh, device identifiers, if you could put in you know, a MAC address, IP address, um, any methodologies. This is when they'll collaborate with cyber teams. You, know, it's, you may put something like MITRE in there, you may put something like what it's doing, is it phishing? So you're putting a lot more of cyber-related IOCs because you're collaborating. Uh, I don't have time to go through this, I think, but basically um, AML was very apparent in the Bangladesh bank heist, uh, which some of you guys may know. Uh, Lazarus was able to send money uh, from uh, Bangladesh bank system to a bank in the Philippines. Uh, they were able to stop a large amount of it, but 81 million uh, went to the Philippines, 20 went to Sri Lanka. Uh, AML was able to see uh, a misspelling with Sri Lanka's, um, Sri Lanka's uh, transaction, and they were able to stop it. Uh, that $81 million, they were able to find some of it, about $15 million. The others, unfortunately, because of a lack of AML, uh, went into casinos, and that money was ready never seen again. So because of that, um, the owner of that bank that let the money go to the casinos, uh, the branch manager, the, um, the employees, they all went to jail, and uh, there was a large amount of AML, uh, AML um, refining of their laws in the Philippines. So that was a huge one, and that just shows we all heard about the Lazarus heist, you know, the Bangladesh Bank heist, but seeing it from an AML perspective and seeing the impact that they did, that's another side of the story. So how can you learn? Look at financial um, journals such as FinCEN, AIDCAMS. If you're into crypto, chain analysis. Uh, join groups like financial fraud groups on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're on a bank, talk to your AML, KYC folks. And just when you read a report, look at the financial crime aspect. Don't glance over it. Really ask questions and dive deeper because that just makes you a better intel, a better analyst, um, professional. Thank you. We did it, we did it, just on the time. Uh, does anyone have questions? Awesome, oh, yeah. Can you go more in depth about the prison, the financial, uh, we talked about the prison systems that are running a lot of Yeah, so um, I was just glancing at that, but yeah, so there are all databases um, in which you can search for convicts um, within the, the prison system. Um, and a lot of times you will have wives, girlfriends, friends who are able to kind of smuggle money into them uh, and because there's an underground marketplace within that. Um, so a lot of times you will see kind of suspicious transactions in which someone is sending money who has a large amount of like family members, right, within uh, the prison. But, you know, maybe that money is going to someone who works at the prison. Does that sound? I mean, a lot of times prisons, you can get a lot of contraband in. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I used to work in law enforcement as well. So, getting contraband is you know, you know, it's, it's, it's not very difficult. And then, obviously, like, you know, systems like PayPal, and uh, yeah. anything, cash app, everything. The thing that most people may not understand is banks have throws of data on every customer. So, I used to review large amounts of data Excel sheets with every transaction. And I'm having to go through are they actually why are they why are they sending PayPal every couple of minutes? You know, it's suspicious. No, um, exactly. And that's why it's important for those skills like SQL and like Snowflake and all yeah. that where you can even slump like where you're doing that big data analysis yes. because you know I'll, I'll I'll tell my wife, I'll say uh, she'll be stuck on something and I'm like Oh, change your query to this, yes. you know, uh, stop wild calling it, you know, yeah. and let's hone in, you know. So I guess I have a question. Someone like myself at Financial Crimes that understands the transaction monitoring and things, that understands how uh, illicit funds can either enter, you know, legitimate funds, uh, how can someone like myself reach out to individuals that are in cyber threat intel and maybe give them ideas or maybe, you know, helping them understand what I do to help them? Yeah. So my my uh, opinion, honestly, is reach out to folks who work in those cyber fraud fusion centers mm -hmm. because, especially the managers, the managers have to oversee a cyber threat intel professional 
usually an AML professional, and usually someone who did law enforcement. So for example, at Symphony, we have on our uh, digital wrist in which they monitor the underground for things like uh, info skills. Let me get out of the way. So we have a digital risk team which monitors the underground for uh, information steals that have like company credentials. Uh, within that team, you have an AML professional, you have someone who did KYC, you have someone who did like 